diplomatic sources tell CBS News that Qatar mediated an agreement between Egypt, Israel, and Hamas in coordination with the U.S. to allow the limited evacuations from Gaza we reported earlier. But that's not the only deal that the country has been involved in recently. Qatar, which is half the size of New Hampshire, was instrumental in facilitating talks between the United States and the Taliban in 2020. Last month, the gas-rich nation brokered a historic prisoner exchange between the U.S. and Iran and a successful family reunification process for Ukrainian kids who were abducted and taken to Russia. John Alterman joins me now. He's a senior vice president and director of the Middle East program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. John, let's start with the Middle East. Qatar is wedged between Saudi Arabia and Iran. How did it become so influential in the region? Uh, they share a gas field with Iran, and they decided in the mid-'90s to invest hugely in the gas. They made an awful lot of money. And as a country with 300,000 citizens now, and even smaller then, they decided that for their own security, they needed to be bigger players in the region. Uh, in 1996, they started Al Jazeera, which was revolutionary on the media scene. They want a little bit of distance from Saudi Arabia, a little bit of distance from Iran, a little bit of a relationship with the United States. And they're always sort of trying to balance between, between all those elements. Let me uh, th th tease up the next question about balance. Qatar is, has allowed Hamas to establish a political office in Doha. The Taliban also opened their first official overseas office in Qatar back in 2013. So... On the other hand, with the U.S., they are a major non-NATO ally for the United States. So how does Qatar maintain a comfortable relationship with the United States, but also, on the other, stand, other hand, entities like Iran that the U.S. says are, are involved in terrorism? How does that work? And when no Middle East, no Gulf states had relations with Israel, Qatar had an Israel trade office in the 1990s. Uh, when the U.S. did the retrogression from Afghanistan, it couldn't have done what it did without Qatari support. And there, there's incredible support from the Qataris. What they say is, look, they're, they're playing a role in between. There are guys you want to talk to. If they're in Qatar, you can talk to them. You can figure out what they're doing. If they're holed up in Damascus, you have no idea where they are, what they're saying, who they're talking to, anything. And Qatar's, what they say is we're not supporting them we're just ensuring that they're integrated and when you want to talk to them, you can. There are other people who say, look, Qatar is sympathetic to all of them. There's, there's institutional connection to the Muslim Brotherhood in Qatar. And of course, Hamas has institutional connections to the Muslim Brotherhood. The money, some people say the money that Qatar gives to Hamas is to support Hamas ideologically. The Qataris will say, well, the U.S., wants us to have a relationship with Hamas to keep it from totally falling apart, to have an avenue if you want to talk to somebody. Exactly what the terms are, nobody's sure, but there are a lot of people who think it is better to have them engaging with Qatar than being totally cut off. And certainly with the Taliban, Qatar provided a platform for us to negotiate something with the Taliban. So now that we've been talking mostly about the Middle East, what about and how does Qatar have a relationship with Vladimir Putin, or was at least able to uh, broker this return of Ukrainian children? Well, as I say, this is a country that's, that's a tiny, tiny, tiny number of people. 300,000 people are citizens of Qatar, and they have lots and lots and lots of money, and it gives them the opportunity to do things. They're willing to, to, to engage people. They got the World Cup, and people say that would involve uh, paying off people in FIFA, but they can do it and they can make things happen. And they're considered to be good partners by a wide range of people. And the Qataris see this as giving them some insurance because rather than being a tiny country that people can just squash, it's a country that a lot of people from a lot of different perspectives find useful. John, is it possible to, to uh, identify the attributes that are required to keep all of these plates spinning with all these different countries without crossing lines so irrevocably that you lose your access to these various countries. Is there something that Qatar has other than ready cash that is a part of this ability to play this role? Well, I mean, you could argue that it's a tolerance for, for differing views. Uh, there was a time when people said this was 
all the consequence of Hamid Majassim, the, the impressive foreign minister, who George Tenet once described to me as a world-class athlete. He was dynamic. Everybody knew him. Everybody trusted him. He was all over the place. But I think it goes beyond personalities. There is a sense, I think, that Qataris have created a role for themselves. Certainly some of their neighbors, especially the Emiratis, feel the Qataris are playing games. But I think a lot of countries in the region, in the world, have felt, you know, there's a utility in having an avenue in to people. Otherwise, it's hard to talk to. Uh, otherwise, it only goes through intelligence agencies who, of course, talk to bad people all the time. But there's a utility in having a, a platform that you can use. And the Qataris are open to lots and lots and lots of ideas, lots of people. And people say that, that there's a use for that. John Alterman, Senior Vice President and Director of the Middle East Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you so much for helping us understand this, John.